too a little short for a stormtrooper. <laughs> What's up, nerds? Welcome to another episode of the Multiverse Report. We are recapping the week's nerdy news from the Daily Bugle to Atlantis and everywhere in between. My name is Mike Gibson. With me as always, Steve Haller. What's up, Steve? A lot, Mike. A lot happened. A lot. I don't know if you knew, Pretty... but there was this thing yeah. this weekend. You were about halfway there. but there Oh, was this... I was more than halfway there. That's <laughs> yeah. a, that was a long drive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was this thing in New York City that they do every year. It's a convention yep. about comics. Yeah. 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 I you know, they the they've Jedi done it a time Center. or two. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it's called the New York Comic Con. Ah, that's it. Yeah. And um I was with my family in uh Sleepy Hollow, New York all weekend. A hop skip and a jump uh, away. I know, having a nice old spooky time in Sleepy Hollow. However, uh that made it so I paid zero attention or was <laughs> unable to pay zero attention to New York Comic Con. So, um the rundown that I made, barely any New York Comic Con news. Steve is in charge of peppering in New York Comic Con um, bullet points <laughs> and topics. <laughs> we'll get fits um, and starts as we go through when this. When he sees fit, yeah. Um, I can and, say, uh, yeah. you know who did go down? Is our good friends at Funky Town Comics and Vinyl. That's true. That is a very good point. Um, some uh, members of the staff of Funky Town Comics made it down and, got, and now have some New York City Comic Con exclusives. Yeah, some really um, pretty ones up on the wall the there. Yeah, um, I believe they got some autographed copies from some of your favorite um, comic uh, professionals. <laughs> we'll stop on into Funky Town. Ooh, what's going on? Nothing in the chat, Brian. Uh, <laughs> Brian touched on what we were talking about beforehand and said that someone should have told DC that it was going on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of Marvel stuff. Um, uh, some cool DC stuff, but it was seemingly more of a Marvel show. Yeah. Wonder if they're holding um, out for something else or who knows? Uh yeah, who knows? Who knows? Um, I mean they're still like in their dawn of DC stuff. Like they had a big they had a few big news cycles, you know, six yeah. to eight months ago, I feel like. And um anyway. Uh we will get into comic stuff later on. We got a strike update. We got uh really I mean, besides comic stuff, we're talking about really two big stories. One's a big Marvel story, one's a big DC story, and they both have to do with behind-the-scenes drama and um, mismanagement of things. I don't know. It's it's going <laughs> to yeah. be wild. Um, we got comic reviews tonight, um, and uh, sadly, we have to open the show. And also, getting a late start, so Brian, anybody else in the chat, sorry for the late start, but, you know, things happen. Uh, but sadly, we have to start off this episode with... Um, uh, an RIP, and that is uh, to the comic writer and artist Keith Giffen, passed away this past week at the age of 70 uh, from an apparent stroke. Um, Keith Giffen is a uh, co-creator of Rocket Raccoon and Lobo, and also uh, the Jaime Reyes version of Blue Beetle. He's known for his work on Legions of Superheroes, also Justice League um, International. as a very um, important and incredible run of uh, comics in the 80s, Justice League International. Uh, he also worked on Blue Beetle, Aquaman, Doom Patrol, The Flash, Suicide Squad, Superman, Thanos, Drax the Destroyer, The Defenders, and more. Um, he didn't just work for Marvel and DC. He also worked for Image, Dark Horse, Valiant, and wrote episodes of television, including episodes of The Real Ghostbusters and Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Uh, a real prolific creator um, uh, in the comic industry, um, and it's very uh, sad to see him go. His death, his death uh, was announced on his uh, official Facebook page in a post that read the following, quote, I told him I was sick, anything not to go to New York Comic Con. Thanks. Keith Giffen, 1952 to 2023. Wah-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, and that uh, was hilarious. Uh, when, yeah, when I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, is that some dark joke? And then I was reading like some of the recounts of other artists and you know people yeah. that knew Giffen and they were like, that was absolutely perfect that they did it that way. Like that was his, you know, his persona. His brand, yeah, yeah very on brand for him. Yeah, so um, RIP Keith, uh, Keith Giffen. Um, sad to see you go, but your work will live on uh, forever. Um, moving on into Strike Watch, Steve. Yeah. I think you and I were both thinking that 
this was going to be the last episode of Strike Watch. We were hoping. We we thought this was going to be resolved. The writers got everything that they wanted, and now the actors were sitting down, and the actors were gonna they were gonna fly through these negotiations and just get back to work. But no, SAG AFTRA is still on strike after negotiations this week broke down between the studios and uh, SAG AFTRA when the actors asked for two percent of streaming revenue. Studios threw up their hands and walked away after uh, issuing a big statement about how we are in it, we want to get back to work, and we are going to sit down at this table until it's resolved. And then, you know, they've just immediately walked away over 2%, over a 2% increase. Um, yeah, uh, 2%, obviously a very small number, of course, that equates to hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but still, when you're looking at you know what CEOs are taking home it still seems like it's something they could easily afford I'm pretty sure something 2% could... of like Max's streaming revenue could be handled by David Zaslav alone and not worried about seems like it seems like it and now if this is the true sticking point uh, I've read that insiders are now saying that this could be weeks or possibly months before negotiations uh, start up again or the strike is resolved I'm sure that nobody wants it to go um into 2024 once i would think everyone would want to get it wrapped up by the end of the year so you know studios could start filming their <laughs> anything anything <laughs> their spring slate they don't you know no one wants their summer slate of um films and shows to evaporate but that's what uh, we're looking at if uh, things don't get settled pretty quick so i guess we shall see um what happens we shall see mm -hmm. Speaking of the strike, and I will tie it in momentarily, but our first bigger story tonight is a Marvel story. And uh, the headline is quite a simple one, but um, the article that reported it, this was an exclusive from The Hollywood Reporter, goes further into the behind the scenes at Marvel Television. Uh, the headline being that Marvel is um, starting over from square one with a little show called Daredevil born again this was going to be um a pseudo extension of the netflix daredevil show uh, starring charlie cox as daredevil again and vincent d'onofrio were over in his role as kingpin unfortunately no other cast members from the netflix show were going to be a part of this as far as we know um maybe that'll change right maybe that's something that they'll that will happen um uh, hollywood reporter reports that less than half of the series was completed but it was enough for Kevin Feige and the other execs at Marvel to see what had been filmed and realize the show just wasn't working. And all of the directors and the head writers and the rest of the staff writers have all been let go from the show. Marvel is looking to hire a completely new creative team. So I said I was going to tie this into the strike. I think this article is half true and half kind of like Marvel trying to save face because i think a lot of the what they have to do like this this article i'm bearing the lead the the article kind of goes into all the problems that marvel has been having with their television shows you know, behind the scenes and like the diminishing returns of a lot of the series to date um uh and it's saying oh we need to figure out new things we're gonna like change the method that we've been the way we've been doing these shows and you know i'm sure that's true because it is true that you know the shows have gotten, you know, you know, there's diminishing returns on a lot of these shows. People aren't interested in it anymore. The brand's being diluted. Uh, but also, you, they have to change how the how they do stuff because of the new agreement with the Writers Guild of America. Right. Like, you have to have showrunners. You have to have a certain amount of writers on a show. Like, you have to have these certain things. You have to meet these certain requirements. So. Marvel kind of saying like, oh, we just looked at it and realized we need to do a better job of this. Like, this is our decision. Yeah, maybe partially, but it's also because you're being forced to do it now because of the writer strike. Right. That's how I look at it. Anyway, it seemed very well, obvious to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you have that, and it's probably a bit of a combination of, uh, especially, especially now. I mean, it's quite advantageous now with the. Uh, strike continuing and that them not being able to film but yeah uh, you know what better time than right now to cut that cut those ties and like drop the axe and say hey we're starting over with 
this yeah. new creative team that's a creative team and not just you know uh, our old classic marvel method stuff yeah exactly exactly and uh, we'll get into that uh, in a little bit uh, as we keep talking and i would say like I, i'm we're trying to hit a lot of points of this article but like the whole article is really good and it's worth it's worth looking up on the hollywood yeah. reporter and reading um uh, if you just look for like Daredevil on HollywoodReporter.com, I'm sure that it'll come up. But the like, and this is the official like on the record. Like, there's people from Marvel like giving quotes to this article. This is an on the record, um, report. Yeah. Um, from Hollywood Reporter. I don't know if they thought this was gonna make them look good, but me reading this article just made me think like, wow, they have no idea what they're doing, or they like they have they're been mismanaging. Learning, yeah their television division the whole like this is it's crazy it's like and some of the things i'll point out as we go along anyway it, but yeah, specifically it, it to daredevil me, you sorry, know what it made me you know what it made me think is that what they ended up with loki and wandavision by accident yeah <laughs> yeah i know well yeah i think that's true and because and even miss marvel like same kind of deal like the yeah that didn't do the viewership numbers but it was it was also like it was a like Loki and WandaVision, it was a fresh take and a new feel and something that was yes. different. And it's yeah. almost like they just stumbled stumbled upon them by accident. Right, right. Um we'll dive into that more in a second. So uh, the specific to Daredevil Born Again. Um the article the article says that sources uh say that uh head writers Matt Corman and Chris Ord crafted a legal procedural that did not resemble the Netflix version that was known for its action and its violence. And that Charlie Cox didn't even show up in its cost in his costume until the fourth episode. So that's put in there as uh, like things that are negative and reasons set up as reasons why they need to reboot this entire show. Two things I'll say that that doesn't line up with me. They told us that it was going to be different than the Netflix show. They straight yeah. up told us like from everything we've seen, we're pretty sure this was going to be a PG 13 version of the Netflix show. We saw Charlie Cox and She Hulk. I thought it was great, but it was like clearly a MCU version of that character. Mm -hmm. We saw Vincent D'Onofrio in Hawkeye. It was fun, but it was clearly a watered down version of Wilson Fisk Kingpin. So I don't know. I think we all kind of knew we weren't going to get the action and violence of the Netflix show. Yeah. Or I think we talked about, we were like, yo, lower those expectations, Daredevil fans. Like, we're not getting season four of Daredevil in any, besides it's the two people that you recognize from that show like right. we're not getting season four of that show so saying that it's a legal procedural that didn't resemble the netflix version like okay that's kind of what you told us it was going to be right so i'm not this doesn't seem like a negative unless just now you think it's a negative you're changing your mind don't make it up like these guys didn't do the thing that you asked them to do right <laughs> you know that's well and part of it might just be too that you know the the legal procedural uh, not the netflix for that all that talk is just like okay well uh, we didn't think it was good and we have to come up with ways to say that we to say it wasn't good yeah yes and the other thing they say is that charlie cox didn't show up in the costume until the fourth episode steve how many episodes of season one of daredevil did charlie cox wear the daredevil <laughs> red right. suit and that's that's what one. i was gonna bring up literally one yeah one like and but that i guess that's that's something I, I kind of get that where if you're saying this is a continuation of the or of the Netflix show, then yeah, him not showing up till the fourth episode is that that's rough. But what Steve. Yep. Season two, he wears it all the time. Yeah. Season three, I don't think he wears it once in season three. He, might he goes back to the man in black because yeah. Bullseye right. is wearing the Daredevil costume the yep. whole time. And I like season three of that show, but it was weird that Daredevil just didn't, or that Bullseye didn't just wear his Bullseye outfit. Right. <laughs> and he's dressed like Daredevil the whole time. And, well, and, and like, if I still liked it, but like, yeah. What? If they're doing the Zadarsky Daredevil, then sure. Like, he's back to finding himself and not being Daredevil. And like, right. But yeah. They're not, like, that would need the action and violence and a lot more stuff. Yeah. Right. So I do get, yeah. like, by the fact that he showed up in She Hulk in his yellow costume. Right. So if that's that's his first canonical appearance in the MCU and then he goes on to not be wearing the costume, I get maybe that doesn't make sense. But to compare it to the Netflix show to be like, 
He's barely wearing his costume in this right. show. It's not even like the Netflix show at all. Like, yo, did you watch the Netflix show? He wears it for one season out of three. Right. And that's it. At so, least at least in season three, it appeared in most episodes, but it was not Charlie yes. Cox wearing it. It was not Charlie Cox wearing it, yes. So anyway, who knows what's going to happen with Daredevil Born Again? Clearly, what I don't remember what who, day who knows? was coming out. We know they don't. <laughs> we, they don't. Nobody does now at this point. Um, if they're smart, they'll just hire the people that made the Netflix show. Huh? Why would you go and Maybe do that, that, Mike? Why Maybe would you that. go and do that? Disney? Jesus. <laughs> These guys that made a really good, really compelling show for three seasons? Yeah. Just, just hire yeah, the, let's... even S. DeKnight and yeah. the other show, the other writers. Mm -hmm. Get uh, Karen Page and Foggy back. Like, just make it. Yep. Just, just do that. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. That's... Yeah. So it's so anyway. frustrating, especially like the uh was it Elton Henson and uh Deborah Ann Wool. Yes. Yeah. Like they're they're available, I'm sure if you they're said available. come come be foggy and caring again, like they'd be they able to the heart of, they were the heart of that show. They were the heart of that show. Not the same show without them. And I, we've talked I'm sure we've talked about this exact point while talking about Daredevil in the past, but I think a lot of recent Marvel stuff, superhero stuff in general, but I'm going to point the finger at Marvel because we're talking about Marvel. I think they have lost the um, plot. <laughs> they, have, they have forgotten the importance of non-powered characters mm -hmm. to support the powered characters in their in the universe, in the series, whatever. And that goes for comics. But like that's... Mary Jane Watson has like superpowers now. Like, no, she doesn't need superpowers. No. She's the girlfriend that's like, she's the supportive person that doesn't have powers, you know? But like, that's why Ms. Marvel like... works so good. Yes. You had the family exactly. that was like, yes. And, and even, uh, oh God, what's his name? Her sidekick, her guy in the chair. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, Bruno. Um, yes. Like, you had these characters that were, not her that were right you know building the world around her yes and yeah that's why um that's why like jimmy and lois and perry are so important to superman yep. that's why gordon and alfred are so important to batman like yeah you need people that don't do the same thing so like leaving the two of them out of the show just made me feel like uh it's just gonna be so mcu we where everyone's got i don't know it's just uh, i don't know it's just it's not the same it's not the same. It was never going to be the same. Anyway. Sorry, would I cut you off when I said anyway? You opened your mouth like you're Oh, no. I just had a stupid uh, Wikipedia thing where I realized that Eldon Henson, who played Foggy, was uh, Fulton Reed in The Mighty Ducks. And Oh, wow. Was also in Idle Hands. Ooh. I never saw that. <laughs> yeah, you, didn't, uh, you didn't miss a whole, whole lot. Like, teen horror movie. Yeah. Right? With, yeah. Uh, was it Devin Sawa was in that or something? Uh... I feel like yes, probably like he was in a it lot was of in that era horror movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, the article goes on to talk more about behind the scenes stuff for Marvel. It basically, says that the Marvel method for TV shows has been that they don't bother making pilot episodes. Instead, they just shoot an entire one hundred fifty million dollar season of television, basically um, on the fly, as this article puts it. They don't hire showrunners. They instead depend on film executives to run the series and rely on post-production and reshoots to fix what isn't working. So basically, they're taking the way they make movies and applying it to television, which is not the right way to make television um, because television is a lot longer. Season of television is a lot longer than a movie, or it should yeah. be anyway. Um, and uh, this article proposing this as them just realizing what a terrible idea this is what a terrible method this is for making television is one of the points that makes me say like how did you ever make anything successful like you said like wandavision like the good stuff has been like a fluke you know um uh yeah. like I just i can't comprehend it yeah um apparently they they talk about moon knight behind the scenes stuff at moon knight they talk about a lot of uh, behind the scenes on Secret Invasion, yep. what was going on there. Um, the example that I uh, chose to talk about because I thought it was crazy was um, Jessica Gao apparently was hired to develop and write She-Hulk, Attorney at Law. But then she got kind of sidelined when they hired the director, Kat uh, Koiro. Uh, but then the production was really challenging and they ended up bringing Gao back 
uh, to oversee the production, um, which is not like a typical showrunner duty, but they don't use showrunners. And it's rare that uh, she had such oversight. And But they said, the article says that bringing Gao back is what showed Marvel how important it is to have a creative through line from the beginning to the end of production of a series. And I was like, how many shows did you make before She-Hulk? Like a lot, <laughs> right? Or you movies. Made like or six like, or seven shows. Yeah, dude, or you made you made your whole the, thing. I'm Kevin Feige being the showrunner for your universe. Yes, dude. What are yes. you doing? <laughs> how are you saying like even if that's not true? Yeah. How are you letting that be printed in an article? <laughs> like, how do you think that makes you look? It makes you look like you don't know what you're doing and haven't. It looks like you're idiots. You're idiots for not real. How do you not realize that there should be a creative through line for a series of television? Well, I mean, neither did, making... neither did Lucasfilm. We saw the sequel trilogy. Apparently, it's all modern film now that just doesn't realize you need to actually have consistency. But I think it is... I feel like as soon as I said that, I knew you were going to bring up the sequel trilogy, it, but... it's too It's too much of a softball, like... What are all these yeah. multi-billion dollar franchises doing when it's like, you you know your base for this is going to be concerned about through lines. But I also think it's easier to lose track of a series of films mm -hmm. when you are jumping from different directors, different writers. Yep. But if you're applying that to a television series which should be one creative team from episode one to episode whatever end episode of a season, Yeah. then that's a, that's a bigger swing and a miss, I think, for me, than a series of films. Because, like, Marvel's yeah. done that with their movies, too, where, like, things don't pay off the way they thought they would. Like, I read a thing today that somebody, there was a report that Marvel really thought Ant-Man 3 was, like, gonna crush it and they were like really happy with it and proud of it and then it came out and everyone was like eh, it was fine right and they were like shocked you know like they don't even understand their own product anymore or whatever like you need you need an outside perspective and you need somebody to guide the ship from point a to point b right and not like okay well yes this is this is the third movie but you also have to account for all this stuff that we did without you in between and these other movies that you had nothing to do with like that's right. a wild thing of course you're going to lose the the you're going to lose the ball well but in the tv it, series it's insane that they wouldn't think of course it has to have a natural arc a creative through line what if we're i guess if we're talking star wars it's almost more like the prequel trilogy where it was where you don't have that that person over you saying no that's not a great idea we got to do this because of this thing that happened back here Instead, you have right. George Lucas, who was just like, I'm going to make these movies. Yeah. Sense be damned. They're going to yeah. get made in this right. way. And it's like, I, okay, great. Yeah. It okay. Was just, they were okay. I love the yeah. characters. The, the yeah. through lines and threads were what they were. The dialogue was a pile of hot garbage. But just like, you know, Moon Knight, there's plenty of faults to it. I do like yeah. some things from it. You know, it's, it's the same. Like, without that oversight, without that no person... You just have this never-ending yes-man cycle that's like, we're going to yeah, make exactly. whatever comes to our head instead of being critiqued on things and yeah. challenged. And it's also, um, yes, so which is why you need a showrunner. Yeah. You need somebody like that instead of having it be Kevin Feige. Because he's a, not only is he like an executive, right? he's an executive to the, like the films. Which he, shouldn't he wasn't be like, during phase one. Correct. He was yeah. more of he was in the weeds. He was a showrunner. Yeah, more so effectively. But he never really gave that up. And you know, there's been a bunch of reports of how like he's being like super stressed, like thin. He's he, he's super like thinned out from yeah. all his responsibilities. So he's like the only one, like uh, just overseeing everything. Mm -hmm. Like you gotta trust some other people. Like you gotta like hire some people you trust or like trust your writers, trust your show like your new showrunners. Um and like let it breathe a little bit because I think maybe if he's clinging to like having this oversight, then maybe that's part of the reason that we're that things are faltering a little bit. 
um, because he's spread too thin. He's not he's not fully devoted to any one project, you know, yeah. um, or any one vision. And so the films and the shows aren't either. Um, right, they have now, two visions right now. Yeah, you're right. They Regular and white. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one's dead, and we don't know where the other one is. Um, but now, apparently, according to this article, Marvel now has plans to hire showrunners. What a genius, innovative idea they're having. Showrunner, finally. Um, uh, yeah, that's okay. So I said the thing about uh, Gao's post-production work on She-Hulk helped Marvel to see that it would be helpful for its shows to have a creative through line from start to finish. Well, I'm glad that it took you that long. Idiots. Uh, showrunners will write pilots and show Bibles. Seemingly something that had not been done before. Insane. Um, and uh, it says the days of Marvel doing an entire series um, from She-Hulk to Secret Invasion and looking at what's working and what's not are done. Like filming an entire series Good. before making any <laughs> corrections. And that's how they do their movies. And they, like, it's, it's a different form. Like You can't expect to make a series of television they shouldn't do their the same way that you make a movie it's a different medium yeah but whatever hey you whatever know, you know what else we should talk about what's that another marvel movie yeah with that in the name oh the, the marvels Mar yeah. the marvel so the marvels uh which is slated to come out i believe november something 10th maybe 10th yep, i november want to say 10th. yeah uh has had screenings and uh there are some early numbers from the you know the the polls that they do and sure whatnot uh and unfortunately it seems like it's tracking for a uh and quote significant drop off and a lower opening weekend than its predecessor captain marvel go figure mm. uh yeah. unfortunately that also um the first weekend of Captain Marvel was 153. They're predicting a 50 to 75 million opening weekend. Wow. Which is catastrophically low and would be, I believe, the lowest, lowest Marvel opening, period. Wow, really? Uh, I want to say it's the, the Marvel's tickets pre sales are 72% behind Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania. So, yeah, um, um, not not great at all. Uh, I am. I know we're both looking forward to this movie. Based I know I'm on excited all to see of this the movie. properties that are tied into it. I'm more excited to see this movie than any other recent Marvel movie besides Guardians of the Galaxy. Yep. And I mean, I'm not gonna go that far back, but like any other recent Marvel movie other than Guardians Three, I'm more excited to see this movie than. Ant Man, Thor. I don't know. I can't remember what else came out <laughs> in the last year, but it was a lot. Right. It was too much. But I, I think, I feel like this has to be partially, partially because there are uh, um, idiot misogynists out there that are campaigning against any superhero movie that has a female lead. Specifically, there's people, they just hate Brie Larson so much. Um, they hated the first Captain Marvel movie because she was in it and because it was good. Uh, or they just didn't want that movie to do good at all. Made a billion dollars. I also think that's like a that's one reason, right? I also think there's been a lot of diminishing returns with Marvel movies lately. And right. the shows, like we were just talking about. Like the the I don't know, the shine is wearing off, I think. Like it's not a Marvel is not a hit machine anymore. And there's plenty of people that still go see them, but, you know, box office is dipping and reviews are dipping huge. So this could just be more like, oh, okay, it's just more Marvel stuff. I saw two other Marvel movies this summer, so I'm going to skip this one. Right. You know? And you combine that with not being able to trot out Brie Larson and Tiana Paris and Amon yeah. Bellani out there. And, uh, you end up with a quote from Nia DaCosta, who's the director of the Marvels, saying, yeah. I'm hoping I'm not promoting this movie by myself. No one's here to see me either. They're going to be like, where's Brie Larson? Yeah. She's completely correct. Yeah. Because, like, the three of them are uh, really great and fun. And if you put the three of them on a couch on The Tonight Show or something, like, that's going to be a super fun yeah. interview. It's going to be fun to watch. Be like, oh, I want to see more of those three. I'll go see the movie. Um, So, yeah, I think that's 
certainly another thing. There's probably people that don't know what's happening. They don't know that it's coming out. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen a trailer or two, but uh, I don't see it constantly. I don't see, you know, toy tie-ins or anything like that, really. So who knows what the marketing can do? Maybe they're pulling back on marketing because... I don't know. It feels like they should be going full throttle marketing, knowing that Brie Larson may not be on the promotion trail. Yeah, for it. you would think. Uh, so if so those if those projected numbers are right in the fifty to seventy five thousand range, uh, or fifty to seventy five million, sorry, fifty to seventy five thousand would be definitively the lowest. That would be, um, yeah, <laughs> real horrible. Seven people went to see this movie. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. At fifty thousand, it would be five thousand under the Incredible Hulk. Which oh. was the lowest at fifty five thousand or fifty five million. Jeez, I'm really killing that. Yeah. Uh, seventy five would put it in the range of Ant Man and the Wasp and Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, um, above Eternals, Thor, Captain America, Ant Man, um, all those mm-hmm. movies before the Marvel machine started, you know, cranking. Wow, so those are like a lot of like, like you just mentioned, like Captain America and the first Ant Man movie, like those and, are like and really, the first Thor. Some of those are like really celebrated movies yeah it's crazy to think that they like you said before the marvel machine that they debuted so low because yeah, like i like look at first avenger only made 140 million in theaters wow and that was the lead up to the avengers yeah which was huge so wow that's crazy thor was 150 ant-man was 130 that is crazy yeah now we just expect every movie to make 300 million dollars in a weekend or some shit right like yeah i mean if it's if it's a movie that has Marvel on it and it doesn't gross a billion, you're like, what's going on here? Yeah, well, I think they got to reset their expectations. I, I think, think so like, too. you know, it's cooled off. People aren't like, even you and I like aren't ex- aren't as excited about these movies like we used to be. Right. I'm excited it's just, it's, about this, but like, what else do we have coming down the pipe? Like, Thunderbolts? Well, now we don't know. Thunderbolt. Everything's get paused. Like, yeah, th- they're making Thunderbolts. They're making. Right. I mean, a bunch of stuff. Brave but, New World. Yeah. I want to. I'm. I'm interested. In what they do with that? Uh, yeah. Blade. If that For ever sure. gets off its stuff and does cool. something. Blade, I don't think Blade's gonna happen anytime soon. I don't either. And then Fantastic Four. Yeah. Like I forgot about. I I keep forgetting and remembering Captain America Four. <laughs> like I keep forgetting uh, that they're making that movie. Yeah. Um. But yeah, well, that's like, mostly were, it shot started, already. It started like getting promoted and gaining some. Uh, notoriety yeah and then the strikes strikes happened and you're like okay well we'll put that on the shelf for a bit and see what happens they were close to done filming i think so not completely so yeah and thunderbolts was in the middle too so yep who knows what's coming next but again maybe it's good that we're pressing the brakes here marvel because people don't seem to be quite as into you oh yeah anymore so 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 yeah fun fun times head by all had by all. Well, speaking of a movie that might not do too well, the box office. <laughs> We're into the DC section now. Moving to DC. Talking about a little movie called Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Or Aquaman 2 for the layman. Um, interesting article from Variety this week. And right. again, similar so- to the Hollywood Report article about uh, Daredevil and Marvel, this is a really good article. I advise you to go read the entire thing if you want more information. Right. And both of these um, from very reputable, like it, we're talking Variety and the Hollywood yeah. Reporter, not like Bob's YouTube channel here. Right. Reputable sources, reputable reporting for sure. So uh, this article was mostly focused on that there's been a lot of drama on the set of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Um, I'm just going to touch on this first part because I think it's gross. Apparently... Yeah, you know, unless you've, unless you uh, only listen to this podcast and no other media whatsoever, you're probably aware of the incredibly messy and lawsuit-filled um, divorce between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Amber Heard, who played Mara in the first Aquaman movie, also plays Mara in the second Aquaman movie. Um, lots of lawsuits and suing each other between the two, back and forth. Apparently, supporters of Johnny Depp, I don't know how this is legal. Apparently, it's legal. Just regular you and me people, Steve, uh, that support Johnny Depp. Not that you and I support Johnny Depp necessarily. Maybe we right. do. Maybe I'm just not. I'm just, 
saying. Regular people that support Johnny Depp paid whatever court fees were necessary to have Amber Heard's confidential therapy notes that were part of one of the trials released to the public. First off, I think that's disgusting. That's just super gross that these are like confidential notes between a patient and a therapist. And somehow because they were used in court, I guess it's right. If they're admissible by court, they're in the public domain. They're in in the public domain and you can pay court fees to get them released. I still think it's disgusting and gross. Right. Whether it's legal, it's reprehensible. It's reprehensible. Yes. Um, some of these, uh, therapy notes, um, the Variety reports that these notes uh, were saying that Jason Momoa, Moa, uh, was drunk on the set of Aquaman and dressed like Johnny Depp in order to mess with Amber Heard. I necessarily, th- I don't think that's. I think the article is misinterpreting those notes. I what I think is that you know I think a, a spokesperson from Warner Brothers said like Jason Momoa is very professional. Sure, he likes to have a, a drink at the end of the day like anybody else, but he was never intoxicated on set ever i kind of believe that i also i don't think that he intentionally dressed like johnny depp to mess with amber heard i think that both you know johnny depp and jason Momoa have a certain kind of swagger and style to them i think the article refers to him as like a, a bohemian way of dressing so i can see jason momoa just kind of reminding Amber Heard of Johnny Depp and making that difficult for her because of the trauma that she went through with like abuse from him and all that kind of stuff. So like that makes sense and that's fair. But I think the article misinterprets it as her accusing Jason Momoa of doing this on purpose. I do not think that's what she meant. I think that's a misinterpretation of the article. We'll probably never know. We'll probably never know for sure. Um, But I don't know. It just seems yeah, a little unlikely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Also, she also felt uh, like everyone wanted her to be fired because of her public lawsuit. I can imagine that being the case. Um, Probably put a lot of stress on people in the production. And we also know that at least two of her scenes got cut. But you know what? I also heard a report that there's been uh, roughly 20 scenes from the movie in general that have been cut. So, you know, can't necessarily say that it was because of her i don't know it's a it's a whole it's it's an insane report it's an insane that that it's even out there he said she said and like yes that it's yeah that it's out there is still it's just not it's gross yeah it's gross that it's even out there um so but this just kind of adds like there's been a lot of drama around this production for a number of reasons but one on set source so the production was actually quite smooth, despite all these rumors to the contrary, saying that the shoot was on time, came in under budget, and only needed like a week or two of reshoots. Like, it's not as it's not as such a troubled production as the public seems to think it is. I don't know. I don't know why. I guess according to this onset source, and again, maybe that's been. Yeah. Um, however, the article goes on to say that despite all of despite it being a relatively, um, you know, uh, smooth shoot. Similar to The Flash and Blue Beetle, like, the public just seems to have this, like, lame duck uh, uh, thought, you know, thought process for all these movies. Like, I don't need to see The Flash. It's not going to matter. I don't need to see Blue Beetle because it's all going to get rebooted. I'm not going to see Aquaman because it's going to get rebooted. Um, despite that being the case for Aquaman 2, this article says that it's possible that it still could do well just because the first movie did well. And... It uh, it's coming out in December when there's not a lot of like similar competition around. Like I think like the color purple is coming out, and, like Wonka is coming out in December. But like it's the only superhero movie that's going to be out in December and then have legs into January if it does well. So like it still could do pretty good. Yeah, if people want to go see it. The Marvels it. doesn't have any competition in November, and that's not looking hot either. That's true. So yeah, superhero yeah, fatigue is... may just be here in a thing. Yeah, it's just all up in the air like crazy. Um. But the the biggest thing coming out of this article, and I don't know, I say biggest because it's being picked up and reported by a lot of other outlets. I feel like the multiverse report, pretty sure that this was going to happen, and this was already the case. Yeah. But the article says the following, in referencing that uh, people may not be wanting to go see it because 
of all the drama surrounding the Amber Heard stuff because it's a lame duck DC movie because it's getting rebooted with James Gunn and Peter Safran. The article says um, referencing all these things as to people not really wanting to go and like, why should I bother go seeing it? It's just going to reboot it. The article says, in fact, none of the cast, none of the stars cast by Zack Snyder, including Ben Affleck, Henry Cavill, Gal Gadot, Ezra Miller, and Jason Momoa will reprise their roles in the new DC universe in character. Hey, grass so, is green. Sky is blue. What's that? And grass is green. Yeah. Well, we hadn't gotten official no's on Godot, Ezra Miller, or Jason Momoa. Right. We even got characters. a partial positive on Godot at one point. Oh, yeah. She said she was still going to play yeah. Wonder Woman. And Although I'm, they came I'm firmly on record that saying that I do not and, believe that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know... Yeah, that whole the 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 whole casting thing is going to be weird when this all when the when the strikes end up uh, clearing up. Yeah, the glut of information we're going to get, you know, right now we're getting unofficial things like our next story, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh it's going to be, I think all especially now that we have writers able to continue to you know cook on what they're doing, uh, mm. there's going to be a lot of a lot more things coming out as soon as the the writer the actor strike is uh, i agree up. i agree and um i'm i'm shocked if anyone is actually shocked by that news <laughs> by that report like of course we knew affleck's not coming back we knew cow's not coming back like there's no way ezra miller is coming back no right. way no way the only one that was kind of up in the air was gal gadot even though i didn't really believe that and now maybe it seems official the other thing that was up in the air, it says, like, we'll reprise their roles in new DC universe uh, in the new D. They will not reprise their roles in the new DC universe in character. Doesn't mean they're not going to show up as a different character. Oh. And. What, do you, who, do you, who do you think Jason Momoa could play in the new DCU? Well, according to this article and according to uh, a story that was broken, like, a year ago <laughs> <laughs> by the Hollywood we're, Reporter, we're, I think. We're, uh, much and, like the, the casting, we're in the worst kept secrets of the dcu exactly uh, conf confirmed this week by um jeff snyder on his um hot mic podcast apparently jason momoa will continue to play uh a dc character in the new james gunn and peter saffron dcu but he'll be playing lobo apparently that is happening um again it was a story that we first heard about a year ago um, confirmed again this week by a source to Jeff Snyder, and it's going to be officially announced in early 2024 after Aquaman 2 has had its day. Um, and uh, yeah, again, like you said, Steve, probably the worst kept secret in Hollywood for the last year. Yeah, seemingly like even Jason Momoa himself has hinted at it greatly. Uh, so the word is that he very well may be. Uh, the villain or the antagonist in Superman Legacy, or may at least have a role in Superman Legacy, or possibly this article says possibly a standalone film. Uh, so that would be interesting. Would not be my first choice for a uh, standalone film, a Lobo movie, but this is James Gunn we're talking about. Right. So he's taken weird space characters and made great movies out of them before. So I'm sure that he can do that with. Lobo. I can see him maybe getting a standalone depending on his performance in Superman Legacy if he's in that. So, yeah, cool. And Momo seems like a good fit there still. We, if you go back uh, uh, multiple uh, yeah. podcasts in the past, we've talked about that. So, honestly, just the most perfect casting, yeah. I think. Uh, it's up there for me in the new, as uh, talking new DCU, we don't, we barely know any casting whatsoever, but. Uh, kind of firing in all cylinders, like almost two perfect castings. We're talking uh, Rachel Brosnahan as Lois Lane, Jace Momoa as Lobo. Bam! Those are mm -hmm. two grand slam casting two character decisions right there. So we'll see going forward. Uh, hopefully, you don't get any more like uh, gross um, drama like that coming out of uh, the DCU moving forward. Uh, we got two trailers this week did you watch these trailers steve i did did you awesome i sure did 
<laughs> we got a trailer for uh, we got a full trailer for Invincible season two, and we got a full trailer for Monarch Legacy of Monsters, the Apple TV Plus Godzilla show. Um, both of these have had teasers before. Now we get full trailers for both of them. Steve, what'd you think of either of these? I Heck thought one. both of them were ridiculously good. I completely agree. Like, yeah, the the hype meter for both of them was high for me. And I think yeah. this, ju- literally, I was watching Monarch, and all I was thinking was, how can I convince my wife to watch this? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I watched the trailer. I was like, my wife was reading on the couch, and I was yeah. like, hey, do you care if I watch a couple trailers real quick? She's like, are they scary and gross? I was like, no, they're not. And um, they weren't. No. Unfortunately, I was right, because I hadn't seen them. I mean, Invincible um, was definitely gross at various points. Sure, yeah. It's, it's animated. animated gross, so. Uh, she wouldn't want to watch the actual... Yeah, theories, I don't same. think, because that shit goes hard. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> For sure. Um, but I think it's possible I could get her to watch uh, Legacy of Monsters, because she was like, wow, it looks good. And, like, again, same thing we've talked about when they released other teasers for Legacy of Monsters. The effects look incredible in that oh, show. Yeah. They were spending tons of money. Like, Godzilla looks so good. Oh, yeah, and we got trailer. a full Godzilla shot, too. Yeah, oh, man, the camera, like, going up his... Yep spine there at the end up to his face for the roar oh yep. man that was awesome <laughs> it looked really good well and i thought i it was one of those where i'm like oh they're gonna cut away like we're gonna go right. up the up the stegosaurus scales and then like cut away right before the the classic but no yeah no just no 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 nailed it got him in all his glory right oh, yeah. there at the end that was great um it's cool i think it looks like a mystery uh it's like those um characters yeah. finding documents and trying to figure out what monarch is or doing research or whatever and yeah like not sure girls, what they're really trying to find out but it seems it like the good. girl's dad was working with Wyatt Russell well uh yeah Wyatt Russell's character mm-hmm. which is also Kurt Russell's character Kurt Russell's character yeah <laughs> uh so the Wyatt Russell version of that character and then in the future meets the Kurt Russell version and right. is trying to do something against Monarch. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, yeah, I like, like the, the older, uh, the Kurt Russell. <laughs> we kind of know this guy's name, so we don't right. have to keep calling him two different actor names. The, the Russell um, character. <laughs> the Russell, that's a great. Um, the Russell character, as an older guy, seems to be anti-Monarch mm-hmm. after having worked with them in his youth. Seemingly. Yeah. Yeah, that seems um, to be where it says we're... something like you can believe that monarch lie or something was in right. the, the line in the trailer. Like, so, okay, that was hmm. new to me. Yep. Then Invincible, I mean, we were both hyped off the first one, like waiting yeah. for season two to come. And yeah, I mean, everything in it from the shapeshifter to whatever that new villain is. Like, I, I've never read any of the Invincible books, so yeah, I don't know what I'm in for for any of this future stuff, but. It looks um, great. Yeah, it does. Like I said, I I read some in, Invincible stuff a long time ago. I don't really remember it at all. Yep. Um, yeah, this looks really good. This like I I forgot about and haven't watched that Alice Eve uh, special yeah. that they put out. I yep. really need to watch that. Same. Um, uh, but this trailer really kind of reminded me because it's been so long since the first season. It's been so long. So I was all. Uh, it's not like I was down on it, but I guess I had just like kind of forgotten how good it was. Right. How good, really. And so this trailer was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This show is awesome. Like, right. legitimately great. So, um, yeah, I'm back on board in a huge way. Yeah, I can't remember. I was trying to figure out who voices Adam Eve. Uh, Gillian Jacobs. Oh, okay. I believe it is her from Community and uh, Love. Fun times. Yeah, she's great. Um, so yeah, check those trailers out, people. Yes. Do uh, or don't some... if you don't want to get uh, get spoiled because they were. Yeah, or don't. We can tell you right now they were good. <laughs> they were good. The shows look good, people. You like those things? Watch them. Um, I know Steve, you got a bunch of comic stuff. The one comic stuff that I wrote down came out of New York Comic Con was uh, Mark Bernardin. Um who we've mentioned on the show before is being fans of his writing, but also his uh, insight and commentary on mm-hmm. the same kind of things that we talk about on this show. Smart guy. Um, it was announced at San Diego, uh, San Diego, announced at New York Comic-Con. He's going to be writing a Mace Windu miniseries. Yeah. 
uh, Star Wars Mace Windu miniseries coming out in January, coinciding with the 25th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. I couldn't find any word on an artist. I saw that his name was announced and a cover artist, um, Mateus Manahani, um, but I couldn't find a regular series artist. They specified uh, they specified Mateus was the yeah, cover artist. Yeah, it says cover art specifically. In the yeah, and stuff written by Mark Bernard, but no series artist, so yeah. I don't know why they wouldn't. It's coming out in January. Like that's not too far away. Like you gotta get drawn. Whoever it is, better announce pretty yep. soon. Um, well, they did the same thing with the uh, the other Star Wars uh, mini that was really announced, which was Django Fett. Yeah, it will be Ethan Sachs, uh, and they didn't announce a. So Ethan Sachs was the one who's currently doing Star Wars Bounty Hunters. Weird. Um, but uh, they didn't announce an artist. Uh, they just said Lionel Francis Yu on cover art weird what's yeah. up with that announce your artists yeah what's going they, on disney you know marvel who knows um uh i read about this i didn't see an announcement or anything for new york comic-con i just read it on i follow mark bernard on instagram and he posted a picture of the announcement and said apparently this got announced at new york comic-con today the force motherfucker can you use it <laughs> see y'all in january referencing uh Famous Pulp Fiction scene with yep. uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Um, so yeah, I'm down for that. I think Mark Bernard is a great writer, and uh, I uh, I always liked Mace Windu, despite not getting a whole lot of um, content from him. But yeah, no, it's get some more pretty soon. Some more purple lightsabers coming to your comic uh, comic store soon. Yeah. So Steve, you uh, were throwing a couple other comic book news items at me before we started rolling uh, tonight that I had missed. So oh, yeah. what do you got there? Uh, well, I guess uh, it is officially announced that uh, if we're staying in the Star Wars vein, that uh, so where is it? The, that one that is Thrawn <laughs> yep. number two from the original um, Thrawn trilogy that was written uh, or that was adapted to comics um, mm -hmm. back in 20 some time. Um, okay. But they have officially announced that they're adapting Thrawn Alliances, which was the second novel uh, in the first canon trilogy uh, that'll be coming out in January uh, with adaptation or adaptation with Jody or Jody Hauser's writing it. Oh, cool. So uh, that should be Jody Hauser's great. Oh yeah, that should be should be pretty solid. Uh, Timothy Zahn is assisting on the. Oh since, wow! Know, he was the the guy. Um, yeah, that one's actually Perfect. signed by Zahn. Ooh, nice! Look yeah, at you. fancy. That was a that was a Funky Town Comics and Vinyl purchase. Oh, yeah. Nice. Uh, couldn't pass that one up. But uh, let's see. Beyond that, if we're, I don't think we're sticking with Star Wars anymore. I think we're heading to DC. DC sounds yeah. good. Uh, and we'll finish it up with the plethora of Marvel issues. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> Jason Aaron is officially joining Action Comics for a, get this, Bizarro Superman story. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, so he'll be penning Action Comics one six or 1061 to 1063 uh, with a story art or story arc called I Bizarro, art from John Timms. I feel like Jason Aaron could do a really, like, really cool stuff with Bizarro. Like the like, I feel like Jason Aaron. Can write a sad story yep. pretty well, and Bizarro can be seen as a pretty tragic uh, character, and when done right, so can you I'm elaborate really for, for those of us who have no clue what you're talking about? What Bizarro is, or who Bizarro? Uh, is? Bizarro is like a failed, is an, an attempted clone of. Well, okay, there's a couple different origins for Bizarro. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that's what we've, I was saying. We've gotten into comics. <laughs> it's either that he is a attempted clone of superman that yep. didn't quite work and so he's a little slower mentally um and the gimmick is that he's like backwards superman like the s on his chest is backwards he's like uh me help when he's like punching somebody and yep. like me fight when he's saving low is or whatever you know like he you know he talks backwards he says the opposite things it's a gimmick um uh, there's also a version of him where he is from a bizarro world where it's like an opposite earth more or less. And there's a lot of bizarros that live on that earth. And sometimes Superman has gone to like help 
Bizarro on that planet. I think I'm getting that right. I could be, you know, gotcha. could be wrong. I, I, many years of my life, he was just a failed clone of Superman <laughs> for me. Sure. I, so uh, the Bizarro planet stuff I know less about, but in either way, he can be seen as a, or used, uh, Superman, the animated series uses him really well like this, where he's legitimately doing what he thinks is right. Um, and when he sees that he is hurting people instead of helping people, he doesn't know. He doesn't know how to deal with that. He can't help himself. He can't save. Every time he tries to save something, he makes it worse, and that is tragic for him. Like he feels bad, like legitimately bad about it, but can't doesn't know how to fix it. Um, and so can lead to some emotional uh, kind of stuff. So, but I think Jason Aaron can kind of tackle that and do it very well i believe so that's cool and yeah we knew he was coming he's shit what is there a thing he's writing for dc is he doing a detective comics thing what's that uh, i thought he was i thought that he was penning something else for superman was it superman also i thought it was a detective comic i could be wrong i don't remember i don't remember um i have a, a quick dc thing the, the one dc thing that i know that came out of um uh, new york comic-con yep was that um, you know, Marvel has their ultimate universe, uh, where it's like, you know, fresh story starting from scratch, more or less, you know, new takes. So you don't have to know the continuity. Apparently, uh, famed Batman writer and comic scribe in general, Scott Snyder, uh, has been hired to create more or less DC's version of an ultimate universe. I don't think they have a name for it yet, but the next... Uh, the next big thing after this dawn of DC uh, wave that we're in right now, which is crushing, doing really great, mm. uh, it's going to be this new re not uh, it's not a reboot to the entire franchise. I think it's like a pocket universe, like the Ultimate Universe for Marvel, but it's right. going to be more on that later. Uh, just like a new continuity, a new continuity for these characters, and it's going to be kind of overseen by. Could you say Scott a Snyder. new Fifty Two? Um, I would not say a new Fifty Two <laughs> because a lot of that was a swing and miss uh except with the exception of a few things including scott snyder's batman run for mm. the new 52 which i think is one of the best batman runs of all time so um i like scott snyder a lot i just praise his batman run like crazy he has a tendency to go in wild weird directions when he's allowed to um uh, he this whole like death metal arc thing that i wasn't a big fan of sometimes he gets like really weird and out there and it's a little too weird and a little too out there for me with my beloved DC character. So uh could be a mixed bag. I have a faith in him that he'll uh he'll do a great job and we'll see. Yeah. I think what else you got? Uh nothing. I think Aaron was I think what we had talked about prior was that Aaron was announced for uh working on action comics. And I don't think this arc will be the only thing he does this year. I think this is just oh, okay. what they announced. Okay. I thought there was something else, but right. might be. You know, you know how that goes. Yeah. Uh, What's some uh, Marvel stuff we got from New York Comic Con. All right. So Marvel, we have officially gotten confirmation that the Ultimate Universe will be relaunching. Um, yeah. With the uh, announcement of three titles. So we're currently coming out of Ultimate Invasion, which is going yep. to this is issue four of four. Um, the. Ultimate Universe number one one shot that will spin out of that will kick off three books in the Ultimate Universe uh, off the bat. Who knows where it'll end up going, but it, you know how these these Ultimate Universes or Splinter Universes go. They go as far as the success of the books that are being written. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, the the original Ultimates with Marvel ended up being a pretty solid, you know, offering in. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, for some sure. of the books. Uh, <laughs> One of the books that was amazing in the, pun intended, fully uh, in the Ultimate Run is Ultimate Spider-Man, uh, which this time around will be penned by Jonathan Hickman with art by Marco Cicchetto. So yeah. any fans of the Daredevil Zdarsky run, uh, the art on that, uh, as well as any of the other things Cicchetto's done, like, you know, I know him from like Obi-Wan and Anakin and a couple, he worked with Sewell on that and a couple other, uh, couple other things. He's a great artist and Hickman is Hickman. Uh, I feel like people either love or hate Jonathan Hickman. Uh, right. There's no in between. Um, and if you know Jonathan Hickman, shit's gonna get weird. 
Yeah, but didn't uh, what else did they say about that? So um, they that announced it's going to be a like a middle aged Peter Parker, right? It's going to be like an older version of the yeah, character. Yeah, it's uh, I'm trying to figure. You're trying to find the quote. Um, oh God, it was. It's effectively Peter B. Parker. Yeah, from right. uh, the Spider Verse films. Spider Verse. So we'll we'll see Sounds where that goes. Uh, the weird of Hickman combined with that just seems like it's going to be great. Because yeah, I'm wouldn't all about that. Um, yeah. Also announced were uh, so that'll launch in January. Uh, in February, they will launch Ultimate Black Panther by Brian Hill and Stefano Caselli, Ooh, which that should be a a new take on that character, which is. I, any of the the more recent runs of Black Panther I've read have all been great. Um, yeah. Uh, and then Ultimate X Men by Peach Momoko. Ooh. So not just art by Peach Momoko, Ultimate X Men right. by Peach Momoko. Wow, dude. So those three books will be the uh, the lead titles for what's going on with uh with that. I think it's uh really smart of them to do a Black Panther ultimate uh book. Like I think I feel like Black Panther is a very popular character, but a character that you can easily get lost if you don't know the continuity because there's been a lot of stuff going on, mantle passing and yep. reboots and you know, things like that. So uh I think that's a good choice. Those those three are good choice. I mean, like Ultimate X Men, Ultimate Spider Man were like huge hits the first time around, and throwing in Black Panther, I think, is a genius idea, for sure. Cool. Yeah, and that was awesome. Uh, Brian Hill, who's done Blade and Killmonger in the past. I think, oh, Caselli does the art on X Men Red. Okay. Oh, dope. I like that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, three more three more titles I needed to pull because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. You why know they, you did. Why do they keep making these good things? Because um, <laughs> they know you'll buy them, Steve. Right. Can they someone just put some them. crap out there, please? Yeah. Don't. Don't. <laughs> don't. Just please don't. But <laughs> Yeah. I'll uh, bite my tongue about my recent uh, decisions regarding my pull list. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to insult anybody, crap-wise. Um, Fair. Comic reviews. I read a comic this week. Did you read any comics this week that you want to review? I did read a comic this week. Oh, I uh, read. Oh, sorry. Last thing out of New York Comic Con. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were done. Oh no, they never mind. It was just a first look. They had announced Sabretooth War before. Uh, Wolverine yes. and Sabretooth are going at it again because there is no better Wolverine than when he and Victor Creed are going claw and claw and uh, claw and claw at each other. I agree. I'm excited to. I'm gonna probably pick up at least that first issue. Yeah. And see what it's about. Um, that'd be the first Wolverine book I've picked up in a long time <laughs> but i'm excited about it nice sure. uh all right comic reviews i read this is the first time i'm reviewing a book from scout comics an independent publisher hmm. um this is a book by jm ringuet or ringway as called uh fungi and yeah. it is about uh um mushroom uh, mushroom mushroom samurai people <laughs> I get it. I love it. Fun guy. Yeah. Um, a very unique concept. Uh, and it's, that's exactly what I just said. It's exact. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> it's a samurai book, uh, with mushroom people. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to read the, uh, the first, there's like a, a little, uh, get to know you or like a setting the stage kind of thing in the beginning. I'm going to read cause it, it summarizes the book better than I ever could. Welcome to a world of high adventure on a planet entirely populated by giant insects and sentient bipedal mushrooms, the fungi. This is a land of epic swordplay and secret martial arts of wandering warriors and honorable fighters. It is a realm of battles between rival clans, rife with treachery, virtue, wisdom, and savagery. It is a place of mysterious wilderness, tree cities, and mystical magic. Welcome to the world of fungi. Um... And uh, JM goes so far as to um, create little maps of the world oh. that he's talking, he's, uh, that he's uh, playing with here. Uh, it clearly reads to me, you know, he's the, only, he's the only character that is credited. 
So um, I can only assume that he is the writer and the artist and the letterer. Um, I gotta say, lettering a little small for me. Yeah. I think he could increase the size of his letter, like the just like I don't know if you can tell. He oh seems yeah. Like Real use tiny. the use the space in the in the word bubbles yeah, a little and more. Yeah, and not not in a way that it's hard to read, but just in a way that it seems a little aesthetically tight. Tight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah he, he also did do, he did do story and art. Just confirmed. Yeah. Okay. He or that she? I don't actually know. I don't know either. Yeah. Jm. I don't know. Um, it is cool. It moves quick. You can tell easily that they have an entire world in their brain and they have lore in their brain that they're hinting at that they're kind of like diving right into Mm -hmm. um because there's like different classes and possibly like races of beings of these mushroom people some of them can do something some of them cannot like it's just you know they dive right into talking about different clans and things like that in a way that not in a way that's overwhelming where I'm like, I am lost because it's pretty clear, right. straightforward story. But like the way that they're referencing things is kind of like, oh, there's a much larger world here that already exists. And mm-hmm. it's just about it's up to me to find it, basically, um, to read along. They do a cool thing where every time uh, every time a mushroom person is killed, it, there's a cloud of like spores that comes <laughs> out like the, the detail of the art is like a. Yeah. Yep. Um, instead of like a slam, it's like a poof or a shush like it's more like lighter onomatopoeias because you're slicing into a mushroom instead of you know a skull Mm -hmm. um it's good i liked it i don't know that it's my taste necessarily as far as like comics that i would like to read but i can imagine like if you're if you're into like uh epic adventure or samurai kind of aesthetics like this would be a great book like it was really well done i really liked it a lot um it just personally for me, I don't know that it's my right. taste in comics. Um, but uh, Scout Comics is an independent publisher. They put out a lot of good work, so it's definitely worth supporting. It says issue two is coming soon. And like I said, I feel like anybody that draws maps of the world that they're talking about in the comic book, yeah, they know. They've got something they going know, on in their head. They got something going on. Yeah. They know a lot more about the world uh, than could ever possibly fit into 22 pages. So. Um, yeah, I would recommend this for sure. If you're into that kind of thing, the aesthetic that I uh, described, you know, just with mushroom people. Um, oh. Fun guy. It didn't, it's not coming out this week. It's already been out. Uh, Jesse's got a few copies on the shelf currently right now at Funky Town Comics. You can go check it out. Issue one. I didn't realize they, uh, they were the artist on Transhuman by Hickman. Oh, no way. I didn't realize that either. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Cool. There we go. All right. Speaking of Hickman. All right. Um, yeah, what do you got this week? Not Hickman. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have some Hickman over here. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about hitting my mic. Uh, yeah. I'm going to talk about Captain Marvel: The Assault on Eden. Oh, nice. Uh, Anthony Oliveria on story. Um, I cannot remember Carlini's name. I'm doing really good for uh, for uh, our standard. You know, video and audio people here. Yeah, um, you're fine. Uh, Maria, or yeah, uh, Eleonora Carlini on art, um, along with Maria Froelich. And it's just in general a solid book. Uh, I went in with zero expectations. Um, yeah. You know, the st- my, my brain always goes to when they give a new number one or a mini prior to a movie coming out, I always yeah. dismiss it. Like I'm like, okay, yeah. they're just drumming up support, whatever. They're this not. This is gonna... a quick cash grab. Yeah. Yep. Uh so instead, with this, um, they actually really well characterized both Carol and then uh so the story is more based on where they are in comics now, more so than in movies. Oh um, perfect. Carol is back on the new Cree homeworld uh of I can't remember the name of it. Um, but after the Cree Skrull War. Um, they were the Cree and the Skrull are now uh, reunited under Hulkling. Okay, he is the emperor of the Cree and Skrull. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, oh. being a cross crossbreed between the two, much as Carol is. Oh, yeah. Um, sure. and Hulkling's husband is Wiccan. 
So the story and the characterization of Hulkling, Wiccan, and Carol in this book is just like spot on. Uh, Very, like each of them feels very individual. Each of them feels, uh, I don't know, it's very well done. And uh, Oliveria was the one who wrote uh, some of the Lords of Empire uh, and like where Hulkling ended up becoming the emperor of the the empire and whatnot. Yeah. Um, really kind of uh, different art uh, that I I felt really gravitated towards the story. Um, oh yeah. Worked worked really well. Hmm. Uh, Carol's hair is amazing. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, you have, um, I guess, uh, also like the you can as you can see the supreme intelligence makes an appearance. Oh sure. So like it's it's a good, solid. Uh, I think it's a four issue mini that it's going to be um, leading into her new uh, her new titular book. Nice. So uh, I I would say it's a, if you're. If you're a fan at all of Captain Marvel, it's well worth a pickup. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I feel like sometimes it is easy to see a miniseries that comes out before like a movie as like just publicity or like cash grab, like we yeah. said. But sometimes I think they're just giving people uh, a way in, you know? Like you're about to see this movie, maybe you're hyped on the character, you want to walk into a comic bookstore and see a number one with that character so you can get into it and jump on and hopefully stay on you know instead of like you walk in and you see oh this is captain marvel 68 like i i don't know what i don't want to jump in there you know a little more intimidating so um yeah i think it's smart to do and if it's as long as you know they're still putting thought into it and it's not specifically cash grab i guess yeah i i was also wrong it's not a mini it's a one shot um oh. but it leads into uh her new series which i guess features billy and teddy like i i guess they're she'll be working with the empire and like it's it's more of a uh off off earth type tale for her which is oh, cool. good compared to like i'm sure we're going to see her on earth most of the time in the movie um yeah i guess we don't know we'll yeah. see um all right this week in your local comic book store. Also, hey, shout out to uh, Funky Town Comics for uh, hooking us up with those uh, books to review. Absolutely. Also, shout out to G. Will Wilson and uh, oh god, he's the Chris Wild Goose on continuing to kill it with Hunger in the Dusk because issue three oh, came out right. last week and it is it's just holding up to anything I can throw at it, like continually. Wow. Great. Awesome, dude. I can't wait. I'm going to probably read a collection of that when it comes out. All you do is rave about it. That's awesome. (laughs) Cool. Um, This week in your local comic book store, you got Astonishing X. I always say (laughs) X-Men, no matter how many times. It's not that. It's not what it is. No. Astonishing Iceman. Yes. I I say Astonishing. I need to follow it up with X-Men. Yes. I just can't. (laughs) That's all. Astonishing Iceman, number three. Avengers Incorporated, number two. Batman Superman World's Finest, number 20. Big Game, number four. Catwoman, 58. City Boy, number five. Crypt of Shadows, number one. Daredevil, number two. Deadpool, Batter Blood, number five. Dwellings, number two. A book that both Steve and I loved very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cool horror book. Can't wait to read that. And also, your Uh, Deadpool, Batter Blood, I misread on the notes as bladder blood and i was like very confused and that's why i looked away laughing not uh i wouldn't be shocked if deadpool had a book called bladder blood yeah that, that actually like would thing. yeah they could make that, that, that work that could, that could work hey marvel are you listening we know you're <laughs> listening that should be your next follow-up is bladder blood it's about he gets punched in the kidneys <laughs> <laughs> repeatedly <laughs> yeah uh anyway gargoyles halloween special number one ghost rider number 19 green lantern war two i read number one i thought it was great so check out number two uh harley quinn black white and redder number four headless horseman halloween annual number one i don't know anything about that i don't know what company it's coming from jesse if you're listening did you order this book and if so can you put it in my pull book pull box please i just spent the weekend in sleepy hollow 
I'm all into Headless Horseman stuff right now, so <laughs> I want this. Um, Incredible Hulk, number five. five. I didn't write yep. the number down, but I think it's number five. It's five. What a memory I have. Still Jay good. Garrick. Still what? good. Still good? Yes. You're still pulling it? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, That's Jay Garrick, The Flash, from. number one. Uh, Justice League, Godzilla versus Kong. Sorry, Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong, number one. Wild and crazy. Okay. <laughs> I can't wait for that. I've seen some of the preview pages. Like, they've been teasing this big. They've been teasing this in, like, the back pages of a few DC books, and it looks pretty fun nice. <laughs> and awesome. Superman fighting Godzilla is a sight to behold. Pretty awesome. Uh, Kill Your Darlings, number two. Miles Morales, Spider-Man, number 11. Nightwing, number 107. Red Sonia, 2023, number four. Rumpus Room, number two. Scarlet Witch, number nine. Sensational She-Hulk, number one. Spine-tingling Spider-Man, number one. Star Trek, Halloween, number three. They are cranking out this Halloween thing weekly. This is a weekly thing leading up to Halloween, I think. Good for them. Star Wars, 39. Superman, number seven. Titans, number four. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number 144. And Victor Crowley's Hatchet Halloween Tales, number one. Steve, what are you pulling? What are you reading? What are you excited about? Hulk. Yeah. Hulk and X. That's where I'm at. Hulk and X. I'm definitely getting Dwellings number two. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll probably grab Can't that. Can't wait to read that. First one was just so wild and crazy and cool. Um, I, I was... You know, Headless Horseman thing. I was in Sleepy Hollow this weekend talking to my wife. I had just recently watched the animated Disney uh, Ichabod Crane thing. Mm -hmm. Like uh, with my the son. classic one? The classic one, okay. yeah, yeah. It's like Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, and I've never yeah. watched the first half of that movie. I've only watched the Sleepy Hollow thing at the end. I had just rewatched that with my son because we were going to Sleepy Hollow. And then the night before we left, I had some extra time at night, and I was looking for a movie to watch, and the Christina Ricci, Johnny Depp, Sleepy Hollow movie. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'll watch this. I've seen this a million times. It's great. Um, I've never seen and it. And I was thinking, oh, it's good. It's worth nice. a watch. Um. It's uh, I got thinking while we were there. This story is over 100 years old. Like it's in the public domain. It's shocking that there's not more headless horseman stuff out there. Like I think yeah. there was like a series on Fox called Sleepy Hollow for like a few seasons. I never watched it because it was I don't know. It didn't look like something. It didn't look like something I would care about. And I don't know that the headless horseman was even like the main villain the whole time. I think it was maybe more like the X Files after a while. But mm. like. You'd think that there would be more, like, every couple of years we get, like, a new Dracula thing. Or, you know, sometimes we get Frankenstein right. reboot where he shows up and stuff. They try, at least try to do, like, you know, reboots of those classic characters. But, like... Right, I mean, like, this year we got the uh, uh, Last Voyage of the Demeter. Yeah, exactly. Take on Dracula and, yeah. Exactly, they announced they're working on Dracula movies or whatever. Like, yo, give me a headless horse. We got thing. Dracula dead and loving it. Exactly. <laughs> Like the the Tim Burton Sleepy Hollow came out in like 1997 or something like late 90s I think, so it's been a while. Give us yeah. another Headless Horseman thing. It's scary. It's fun. Do it. Figure it out. Hollywood. Wait, hold on. So you back this up. You had never seen the Wind in the Willows section of Ichabod and Mr. Your uh, Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Okay, I mean, when I was a kid, I saw a thing called Wind in the Willows. Is that the same thing as the it's Mr. Toad like section of that? Kind of this, yeah, I think it's the same story. I don't know if that's... I think so. I, think, I, I, I must have seen it when I was a kid. But yeah. I remember the Sleepy Hollow right. thing. Okay, so that's scary. what that's what sticks with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when yeah. you're a kid, it's scary. And even my son watching it, you know, he just turned seven, but he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like, you yeah. know, when... And it, it's like lighthearted and goofy for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I... Every time I watch it, I think it's shorter than it is. It's like 35, 40 minutes long. Yeah. And so much of it is just like, look how weird of a guy Kabod Crane is. Mm -hmm. He eats like crazy. And it's like, you know, it's a pretty faithful adaptation of the story. And then like just the end is like, oh, there's this ghost story about the Headless Horseman. And then in the next <laughs> right. theme, he's getting chased by the Headless Horseman. So it happens real quick. Um, you mean Bing when Crosby it gets is getting scary, chased by the Headless Horseman? Yeah, yeah. Bing Crosby's singing a little song. <laughs> um, 
but uh it's a it it takes a hard left turn when it gets spooky it gets real spooky for mm-hmm. sure um so that's the one that's burned into my brain i'm sure that i've seen the Ooh, wind in the willows yeah. part for sure but i just don't remember anything about it because it's just not like that. i remember they showed us when i was a kid in elementary school near halloween they would show us the ichabod section of that right. movie when like when they pull us into the gym and we'd all like watch that like <laughs> i actually i remember one year they showed us like cut up like cut up versions of like the universal horror movies like i remember i saw like frankenstein oh wow like, it wasn't the entire thing but they like i think they showed us like the creation scene then they showed us like the ending of yeah. him being like hunted or whatever through but like that's pretty dark like yeah they light him on fire in a windmill mm-hmm. and like that's how that movie ends the original frankenstein movie. they show that to me when i was like five or six <laughs> or whatever in a gymnasium floor like i remember seeing that oh, and wow. i don't know it's one of my favorite horror movies still the original frankenstein so the 90s were a time why. like the 90s were a time yeah they're like we can show these to kids right it's an old movie it's wild. Yeah, like I watched be. it this no year. No problems with that. I was like, I wonder if I can. I, I'll. I should rewatch Frankenstein to see if I could show it to my son. And I was like, Oh no, this is no. It's too intense. Like yeah, and like the the parts that aren't intense, he would be bored by. I think. Right. He doesn't care about Doctor Frankenstein and Elizabeth's wedding <laughs> or anything like yeah. that. But then the other stuff is just like, oh, this monster is throwing Doctor Frankenstein off of the top of a windmill and then getting burned. Under, like a yeah. bee. I'm like no it's horrible horrible anyway long story short hollywood make more headless horseman stuff because yeah this guy will buy it just like Fair i want to buy that comic book i don't know if i'm going to be able to but we'll see and i think that's all i got steve i think that's all i got this week i'm tired yeah i, I think that's today. that's everything i got too i yeah. would say if you would like more uh because we don't have more today but if you want to find more in the future uh, yeah. Feel free to follow us on any of the socials, Multiverse Report, all around everywhere you can find us. Um, Blue Sky now, too, because why not? Uh, Have we posted one thing on Blue Sky? Uh, we posted one thing today. Okay, great. Great yeah. job. Yeah. You got to give me the uh, access to that so I can. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I... um, uh, beyond that, uh, the Multiverse Report at gmail.com, Multiverse Report.com. Leave us a review. Instagram, yeah. Facebook, Multiverse Report. Find us there. Check yeah. out your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review. We'll read it on air if you want us to. Uh, we sure will. We won't if you don't. But, you know, drop us a five-star review. That really helps the computers tell people to listen to us. And uh, other than that, I think I think that's uh, the tail end of this. All right. Well, that's all I got, too. So until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you in the multiverse.